Good morning, and thank you for coming. Over the past 12 years, as some of you know, I've spent a great deal of time uh, researching, teaching, and writing about sex. And specifically, my area of research is about sexual pleasure, enhancement, and sex play, including how men and women can have better sex in spite of the many challenges that life throws at them. Now, when sex researchers and educators like me talk about sex play, what we're usually referring to are the many ways that people have sex. So things like oral sex and breast stimulation, vaginal intercourse, and the use of sex toys. Today, though, I want to consider sex and play in a different light. And I want to start with talking about something that you might not expect to hear from a scientist who studies sex. Namely, I want to talk with you about tree houses. <laughs> now, tree houses, as you know, can be small or large. They can be simple. They can be just a few boards climbing up a tree. They can be prefabricated or handmade, and they can also be pretty fancy. But at their core, at their foundation, all they really are is a few wooden boards and a tree. How a few boards and a tree transform into this magical treehouse where anything can happen and anything is possible is to me an interesting process. And I believe that the same features that transform these wooden boards and a tree into a magical treehouse are the same features that can transform our sex lives. The first is perspective. Now with the treehouse, someone, usually a child, has to come along and look at these wooden boards in the tree with, from a perspective of possibility. To climb on top of the boards and see a tree house, a fort, a castle, or a kingdom, and not just some shabby pieces of plywood. When it comes to sex, we adults know that sex can be a lot of things. It can be loving, exciting, awkward, and sometimes it can be achingly lonely. Wherever it starts, though, it has the capacity to get better. Scientists have found that reframing negative thoughts to positive thoughts, such as telling oneself that one likes sex, that one enjoys being touched and finds it easy to experience orgasm, can make for better sex and enhance women's sexual arousal. Several studies have also found that mindfulness techniques can enhance sexual experience and function. As a way of teaching about mindfulness techniques in sex, when I teach human sexuality classes to college students, I sometimes bring in a big bowl of strawberries to this lecture hall. I pass the bowl around and I invite students to take two strawberries and put them in front of them on the napkin I've provided them. Then I go ahead and I ask them to eat their first strawberry just as they normally would. And a few seconds later, when they've all eaten the first strawberry, I ask them how it tasted. And you can imagine, for people who have just gobbled up a strawberry really quickly, especially hungry college students, I get some pretty mediocre responses. Then I ask them to prepare to eat the second strawberry, but knowing that they're going to hold it in their mouth for a full minute before I ask them to go ahead and eat it. Now, during this minute, I invite them to bring the strawberry up to their lips and to feel how that strawberry feels against their lips. To slowly open their mouth and bring the strawberry into their mouth feeling how it feels on their tongue, feeling the seeds against their tongue, and putting their tongue over the strawberry and then pushing it to the sides of their mouth and rolling it along their cheeks. All along, noticing the texture, noticing how it feels and how it tastes. Then bringing it to the roof of their mouth and slowly sinking their teeth into it as they chew it and eventually swallow it. When they're all done, I ask them again, how did the strawberry taste? And this time, I get radically different responses. They generally have had a richer experience of eating the strawberry and feel that it tastes more tasty and wonderful and all of those things. Now imagine how this changed perspective translates to sex. When you focus on the feel of your partner's lips, the smell of their hair or their skin, the way it feels to touch them, and the taste of their various yummy body parts. The difference between getting sex over with so you can fall asleep is remarkably different from the intense makeout sessions that many of us remember from our adolescence and that too few of us experience with any frequency during adulthood. The kind that are so good that you remember how someone's hair smelled and for years later your heart races or sinks 
when you smell that shampoo in a drugstore aisle. Perspective matters. Second, the tree has needs exclusivity. To accomplish this, kids often make signs that say, keep out, or no boys allowed. Sometimes they say, except my dad. <laughs> tree houses are often a place of refuge where children hide from neighborhood bullies or parents calling them in for dinner. Exclusivity matters to the bedroom tree house, too. Although some couples find that open relationships work for them, many long-term relationships are or strive to be monogamous. People often want to stake at least some degree of claim over their partner's parts, from their lips to their most private parts. For many couples, then, the bed becomes a sacred place that outsiders are not allowed into, or else it's the ultimate act of betrayal. The bed, like the treehouse, is a secret members-only clubhouse. It gets its value not from the thread count of the sheets, but from adults' ability to make meaning out of that space, to make love, as the air supply goes, out of nothing at all. The bed is such an exclusive place that in one study I conducted about the effects of pet dogs and cats on human sex lives, I found that although most people allow their cat or their dog to sleep in their bedroom, more than half of people who own cats or dogs make specific efforts to keep them out of the room while they masturbate or have sex. For some people, this is due to concerns about their pet scratching them or biting them or their partner during sex. There are cats who chase vibrators and lick lubricant. <laughs> there are also cats who sit on men's shoulders while they perform oral sex on a partner. Or who run across the bed in the middle of sex and swipe at anything that moves, including breasts and scrotums. <laughs> Other people just don't like the way that their dog stares at them during sex. <laughs> Number three, playful discovery. A good treehouse needs to be a place of playful discovery. Though small in size, there are no boundaries in terms of who one can be inside of a treehouse. A child can be a pirate one day and an imprisoned princess the next. They can invite friends over to pretend that they're wild animals in a zoo. Or they can sit alone inside the treehouse with a friend and share raw and soulful secrets in a way that children's secrets often are. Through playful discovery, the bedroom treehouse has the potential to be far more than the place that we sleep. Although the bed isn't the only place for kissing, cuddling, and sex play, it is the most common place for sex. It's where we adults play. Instead of playing cards, though, we play at creating new life, playing with what leads to pleasure or orgasm or what doesn't, and growing our romantic relationships. The bed is also where relationships are most fragile, where we celebrate them, and it's sometimes also where they fall apart. It's where partners have serious and meaningful conversations, and if they're lucky, the occasional pillow fight. It's also where we hole up and hide when the world outside gets too tough, where it feels like everything else could fall apart and we would still have each other in a bed that feels like home. Sometimes what we discover through sex play is that we're sexier and more attractive than we ever imagined, at least in our partner's eyes. In a recent study, a colleague and I asked women how they came to love their genitals, if indeed they did. A 24-year-old woman said, I feel that I'm really lucky and that all of my sex partners have been incredibly sex positive and very educated and comfortable with my genitalia. I know from talking to my female friends that this is not always the case for many women, and often women are hurt or shamed by their partner's attitudes. And then there was a 63-year-old woman who said, a sex partner who loves your vulva is a wonderful, validating experience. I wish it for every woman. Four, there's risk. For children, playing the same game every day is boring. They may think not hide and seek again, not because it's a bad game, but because it's better mixed up with playing house, tag, soccer, video games, or connect four. Whether we're talking about treehouse play for children or sex play for adults, trying something new isn't always easy. There is difficulty in risk. Bad things sometimes happen. But the motivation behind risk of a gamble is that something wonderful might happen too. Sexual experiences alone or with a partner can help people to feel young, to feel alive, and that there is still an enormous amount left to discover. Unfortunately, in sex, we adults often get stuck in a predictable routine, and we believe that we know how everything works, what turns our partner on and what brings us to experience orgasm. 
Although self-knowledge is good, if we shut off all possibilities that there could be other body parts that feel good to be touched, or other ways of kissing or licking or moving in and out of each other that feel pleasurable, then we're missing out on the richness and variety of sexual experience. We need to stay open to and curious about trying new things. In our Indiana University research team's recent national survey of sexual health and behavior, we surveyed men and women ages 14 to 94 about their sexual lives. In looking at adult sexual behavior, we found that more than 40 combinations of sexual behavior that people engaged in during their most recent time they had sex. So if you're stuck in a rut, there is hope, and there's plenty to try. Find me at the break if you'd like suggestions. <laughs> Five. We need to share ideas. Two kids sitting in a treehouse fort don't need to guess what they should play. Why? Because they talk to each other. They share ideas. One might say, I know what we should do. Let's draw pictures of monsters. And the other one might say, nah, let's drop water balloons on your brother instead. Kids keep talking and sharing ideas until they hit upon one that they both like and they both feel like playing. And sometimes they make deals. My sister used to agree to play Barbie with me if I would play My Little Pony with her. Imagine if we could apply this treehouse principle to sex. If we could talk more openly, unafraid that our partner will think our sexual interests are weird, perverted, or just plain boring. If we could ask explicitly for what we want, be open to sex play that appeals to our partner, but perhaps not to us, and say no with kindness to sex that we're absolutely not into. The moment. Some researchers say that a key characteristic of play is that it's focused on the means and not the ends. It's about the moments. Think of how children splash through sprinklers or puddles or how a dog fetches a toy over and over again. In my work, I often hear from individuals and couples who are performance-based about sex. They want to achieve an orgasm at all costs or to last at least 30 minutes before ejaculating. They're focused on the destination and not the in-the-moment pleasures of sex. And yet, as humans, we're built more for play than for performance. There is no easy orgasm switch, especially for women. The vast majority of the clitoris is hidden beneath the surface of the body, leaving only about a quarter or half of an inch exposed. Like any good video game that you have to play over and over again to score secret points or get to the next level, <laughs> sex, too, is a nuanced game. In a study that we conducted about vulvas, a 32-year-old man said, it's like a mystery cave that over the years I figured out spots that are good hiding areas and can arouse a woman. <laughs> men's sexuality is complex as well. Too often we oversimplify men's sexuality, ignoring important aspects such as their body image, feelings, and needs for intimacy. Two recent studies have found, for example, that kissing, cuddling, and touching were among the strongest predictors of men's sexual satisfaction. But curiously, this was not the case for women. Finally, it's the getting back up. When I was six years old, I fell off a ladder going up a treehouse and I broke my wrist. But it didn't stop me from climbing up again once I got better. This is relevant to sex. I've seen too many people's sex lives hurt by beating themselves up over their difficulties with orgasm, erection, or when something embarrassing happened to them during sex. And yet, sex is like play. Sometimes we lose, fall, or mess up, but we can try again. What we know from research is this. Nearly every man and woman has had their heart broken, and nearly everyone has broken someone else's heart. We also know that the vast majority of highly sexually, sexually satisfied couples, about 95% of them, say that they sometimes have bad sex or sex that's just okay. It's the picking up and starting over again that matters. There are good reasons to take a playful approach to sex. Sex is where we get to see another side to someone that few others get to see. In bed, they're stripped of their clothes, their makeup, their car, and stripped, perhaps, of the way they try to hold themselves together in regular life, as if they've got it all figured out. In bed, we can sigh. We can touch. We can give and receive pleasure. We can make noises. We can make love. And we can even make babies. But all of that love, pleasure, giddiness, sexual expression, goosebumps, and new life that's created in bed is stuff that we bring to it. Because at its foundation, the bed, much like the treehouse, starts with just a few wooden boards. Thank you.